news behind me. Um, <laughs> that's where I am in their offices today. Um, I really appreciate uh, being part of this mediatized EU project, though. Uh, important to note for everybody who is uh, joining the event and who is who is here that this is going to be recorded. So if you say anything, if you speak, if you are willing, and we really want everybody to, to, to do so, to ask a question, that that will go on a video recording. Um, so the Mediatized EU project is a, a brilliant new project looking at how uh, representations uh, of the EU are sort of put forward, put out uh, in, in media discourses across the European Union and on the outside of the borders as well. What people like, the things that people like me do, how they're picked up, how they're, they're moved. It's a really, really exciting and interesting new project. And as, as I say, I'm super, super honoured to be participating in this, and I'm really happy to be the moderator today. I am going to let this project speak for itself. There are people that are, uh, are really, really obviously on board with the project. We're going to outline exactly how it works, what's going on. Uh, and for a first opening uh, statement, we have Samuel dovery Vestervier, who is the Managing Director of the European Neighbourhood Council. And I'm going to give him the floor for a few minutes just to outline exactly uh, what's going on. Samuel, good morning. Uh, good morning. Hi, hi, Jack. And uh, good morning to everyone, partners and uh, people who are listening. And welcome to uh, today's launch event for uh, EU Mediatize, uh, our project um, with partners. Uh, unfortunately, uh, MEP Ilan Kuchuk, who is the Vice President of Renew Europe, was not able to uh, make it uh, this morning due to an emergency travel because of elections in Bulgaria, and as a result, I, uh, I have stepped in uh, just to say a few uh, introductory remarks. I can say that uh, Ilhan will be uh, hopefully at our next event, he promised, so uh, we will be uh, blessed with some parliamentary uh, presence next time instead. Um, just very briefly about the project. So the full name of the project is uh, EU Mediatized, Mediatized Discourses on Urbanization and Their Representations in Public Perspective. Uh, the short name, as we call it among partners, is uh, EU Mediatized, and we're seven uh, research partners from across Europe, and we're looking at, you know, how Europeanization or the so-called uh, European idea and integration project uh, basically has transformed and is transformed uh, through uh, changing media narratives and discourses, and also uh, what has been pushing this exact a transformation. Our partners uh, include a, you know, a diverse selection of researchers from across uh, Europe, and uh, they include DCU, uh, Nebria, Taltec, CES, ENC, Corvinus, and CSS. And uh, our researchers have really been selected by the European Commission to answer these kind of tasking and, and also difficult research questions over a uh, four year period under the, under the H2020 umbrella. And the task is primarily uh, research oriented, but the purpose of our findings is of course, uh, really for policymakers at the EU and national levels to also be able to implement the recommendations that we come out with and, and basically to better understand the media environment and its impact on uh, society. So the reasoning uh, behind the project is, uh, is rather simple. Uh, EU media is known to be, to be impactful. And according to most literature, it directly affects uh, citizens' perspectives on Europe, especially on a, on a local national level. And furthermore, the, the, the media is going through kind of what we could refer to as a rapid transformation as a result of a multitude of factors like digitalization or fake news or social media in general, but also other elements, uh, which our research project then is trying to examine over the next four years in order to understand how that impacts um, citizens' perceptions. And then finally, um, due to things like shifting media ownership or political pressure, political cultures, languages, among many other factors, we're also potentially uh, witnessing uh, discourse changes and, and narratives which are more difficult to measure without using kind of mixed methodologies and 
and which both which will both include uh, quantitative and qualitative analysis as well as uh, content and discourse analysis. And I think that that both Tanya and also Lika, who is really in charge of the methodology, will will be talking about this uh, in, in much more depth afterwards. But in essence, um, what we're trying to understand is who says what and, and why in the media uh, about Europe. So for media experts and journalists and also policymakers and academics, uh, these findings are likely to be of interest. Um, and we would be very happy to share our findings with you along the way, which we will be doing on our website and also on our social media. But we equally um, need uh, your feedback and expertise. And, and as everyone uh, knows all too well, you know, there's little point in conducting large scale research if no one reads it. And there's absolutely no point if, um, if we don't get practitioners views uh, kind of on board along the way. And um, so that's very important for us. And that's also one of the reasons, um, really one of the reasons why we're doing the event today. And, um, and to briefly also uh, be able to give some basic understanding about the project. And of course, um, it's also important for us that um, you know, whoever in here is not already following us on social media and um, that they uh, log on and have a look at our social media, not, namely our Twitter, which is um, at uh, mediatized underscore EU. Because on that Twitter, um, but also on our website, we'll basically be providing lots of the information along the ways, whether it's about events or whether it's about new findings or about meetings and research and engagement. And that will basically all be readily available on, on, our, um, on our social media. And that's a very easy way for anyone who's interested in understanding about how uh, discourses in the media impact citizens can basically follow this project for the four uh, year duration. And then uh, finally, uh, I would like to very much, um, well, I appreciate to be able to draw on, on the expertise and knowledge um, in the specific field of media um, and especially among the knowledge and, and, uh, and expertise, which is also in the, in the room today, but also among the journalists and experts who will be uh, with us throughout the next four years, you know, We'd be thrilled to be able to have your feedback. We'd be thrilled to be able to engage with you on a regular basis, uh, both through, uh, you know, meetings, uh, uh, interaction between partners, partners and, and, and local actors on a national scale, and also send you kind of updates on our research findings and get feedback during the upcoming events um, so that we can really process all of this um, and share it with media practitioners, policymakers, and, and of course, most importantly, with the journalists themselves in order to understand you know, how much of our research also corresponds with what's happening um, in, in practice. So I will uh, stop here and uh, briefly first say, of course, thank you to all our partners um, because that's, they're a very, very important part of this project, the, the backbone. And also uh, thank you to the audience that we have today, both for being here uh, today, but also uh, hopefully for to see you in the future and to be able to engage with you more. And I give uh, you uh, back the word, I think, Jack, because you're moderating. And uh, I look very much forward to hearing our excellent speakers on the relevant topics um, and relevant topics and, and to be able to hear how we can contribute towards and engage citizenship in a better and more inclusive uh, and informed future. Thanks. Thank you so much, Samuel. And as he said, uh, the, the Twitter handle, hashtag, um, not hashtag, at mediatized underscore EU. If you want to talk about this event while we're doing it, that would be great. And just use that handle, tag it in on anything that you're finding interesting. Feel free to tweet things. You can tweet me as well, at Jackie Pat. E. Parrock, and I will retweet and we can start discussions there as well. It's really important. We want this to be a sort of a live discussion. You can also be asking questions. We're going to hit, have some presentations from some uh, participants in this project. But if you have any comments that you'd like to start chatting as well, either whack them on Twitter or into the chat, uh, chat here as well. And I will start picking them up after we've had those presentations, of which we have three. 
We have Dr. Dr. Tanya Lockott, who is the Associate Professor in Digital Media and Society at the School of Communications Faculty of Humanity and Social Sciences at Dublin City University. I will introduce her and give her the floor shortly. We also have Dr. Leah Tuladze, who is the Executive Director at the Centre for Social Studies and Associate Professor of Sociology Faculty of Social and Political Sciences at Tbilisi State University, who will give us a short presentation as part of this event uh, after Tanya. We then have Stephen O'Shea and Kieran O'Driscoll, who are both from the European Movement in Ireland, and they are going to give us a presentation, a joint presentation as well. Firstly, we're going to have an introduction and overview of the Mediatized EU Horizon 2020 project from Dr. Tanya Locott. So, Tanya, the, the floor is yours. Give yourself a brief in introduction as well. Explain who you are. Uh, we're going to have some slides as well straight away. Uh, Tanya, lovely to see you. Good morning. Handing over to you. need to unmute myself because that's conducive to giving a presentation. Um, thanks so much, Jack, and thanks so much, uh, Sam, for, for this introduction. I was going to joke and say you sort of stole a lot of my lines, but I'm going to try and provide um, a little more uh, a kind of deeper and, and both deeper and broader introduction to, uh, to our wonderful project. Um, and it is, again, my pleasure as a representative of the project coordinator, Dublin City University, to welcome everyone here this morning. Um, and to, to really use this opportunity to, uh, as one of the first sort of public events, to, to present our project and to present our ideas and also our aspirations for what we hope to do within, uh, within the next four years um, in the project. Um, so the key questions we are trying to grapple with um, in our project um, is, you know, this, this really big and seemingly simple question, how has the European idea transformed in media discourses and public imagination? And what are some of the key factors that are shaping these transformations um, over the past several decades? And we know that the media coverage of the EU um, and debates about um, the European identity and the European project and the European idea have always affected citizens. Uh, and their perceptions of, of the European Union. Um, and we know from a wealth of previous research that media organizations um, are central to how um, people think of Europe and the European Union, but that they also tend to cover EU matters adopting a national perspective, right? So they talk about Europe in the context of their own national um, affairs, um, and they consider uh, things that um, are important to domestic actors uh, and domestic arguments. And we also know that, especially in the recent decade uh, or so, media coverage of the EU can often take on this sort of cynical um, tint, um, which, of course, you know, is, is generally kind of this trend of a more uh, cynical representation of politics, uh, which makes the public somewhat more alienated from uh, from the European project and from political processes. And so we'd really like to, you know, to take this moment, which I think is a very important moment, to grapple with how the changing media environment, um, we've seen huge transformations in the European media sphere. It's become, as, as Sam has said, increasingly digital, but also quite fragmented, sometimes polarized and dominated by big tech platforms. Uh, which bring their own rules and their own interests. How is all of that contributing to major changes in how the EU is communicated uh, to citizens and also how it's perceived by citizens? And of course, as part of our projects, we're also, we're also really interested in um, who are the key actors um, in this process and how can they legitimize or delegitimize specific media discourse, discourses about the European project? And so that is really... Uh, these are some of the big questions that our project um, is, is grappling with. Um, as uh, was already said, um, our project has a long title and also a short title. And the, the long title, Mediatized Discourses on Europeanization and Their Representation Public Perception, um, sort of really tell us part of the story, right? So we are interested in analyzing the discourses that circulate in European media um, and uh, media in the European neighborhood as well. But we're also interested in how those discourses impact the public thinking about um, and the public understanding of Europeanization. So you really want to trace the discourses and then uh, consider who shapes those discourses and then to see how uh, they impact public perception. And so our project uh, 
we think comes at a crucial time um, as the European Union is seeking to reimagine its future and to attempt to um, understand um, in, in a very coherent way what are what is that uh, what are those future steps and what future developments uh, can help uh, continue to shape the idea of Europe and the European project in a constructive way. Um, and so our project is going to span the next four years. We started in January 2021. Um, and so we will run until the end of 2024. Um, and for us, this is a really important time because we think we're going to see a lot of change in, in these four years, but we're also going to see a lot of really specific efforts um, on the part of the European Union and the European Commission and all the other institutions to try and understand what are the forces that um, they have to contend with uh, that are shaping people's perceptions um, of what Europe is but also of what Europe should be. Um, and so it's really fortunate that we have these excellent research teams, which are interdisciplinary from seven countries, including countries in the European Union and countries in the European neighborhood um, that have come together to, to pull their knowledge and to pull their expertise, to provide those insights um, into what forces shape um, media discourses um, on Europeanization and then how those discourses impact perceptions of the European project. So among the things that we seek to look at are, uh, you know, threats uh, that have already been revealed and acknowledged, uh, things like polarization, misinformation, but also to identify some opportunities offered by this new hybrid media environment for uh, shaping uh, the idea of Europe and for promoting constructive um, and forward-looking discourses on the European project. So just briefly again to, to say we have project, uh, we have project partners uh, from Ireland, where I'm currently beaming in from, uh, Georgia, um, and uh, Dr. Tuladze, who will be speaking next, um, is, is beaming uh, in from Tbilisi. We also have partners in Spain, Estonia, Portugal, Belgium, and Hungary. So you can see this is quite a diverse consortium, and I think this is one of our strengths. Um, Obviously, uh, you know, it's not just about geographical diversity, but also the fact that we have cross disciplinary teams, we have sociologists who actively work on the issues of Europeanization and the development of qualitative and quantitative methodologies, we have lawyers uh, and legal scholars who specialize in EU law and who have active experience working with policymakers, we have political and social scientists who are studying European affairs and public opinion on these issues and communication and media scholars analyzing media markets, media framing, and uh, media discourses. In addition, of course, uh, we don't just have academic partners, but as was evident from Sam, who was just introducing um, this, this round table, we also have practitioners uh, and consortium partners who have extensive experience working in um, the media sector, the nonprofit sector, working with journalists, policymakers, and other um, civic stakeholders. So it's really important to us that we have that element and that we all engage not just in producing academic peer-reviewed articles, uh, but also other kinds of engagements, uh, such as public events, um, you know, things like producing podcasts, sending out newsletters, to engage um, the public more broadly um, and to disseminate our results to them, but also to get their input and to get their feedback, because that is hugely important to us um, as, you know, as a public uh, research project and as a public research consortium. Um, so again, just to briefly run through the aims of, of the project, um, our big undertaking is to study the framing of the European project and Europeanization in traditional and new media and its representations in public opinion. And so we want to look at the framing uh, of and the identity factors related to Europeanization in the media um, and how then they uh, impact uh, public opinion, how they're reflected in what the public thinks. We also want to explore the role of political and media elites in the media framing of the EU discourse and identity factors that are related to Europeanization. So we'll be talking to political elites, um, lawmakers, uh, local politicians. We'll also be talking to media elites, so media editors, uh, star reporters, those opinion makers uh, and opinion shapers and influencers across our seven countries. And then we will also seek to trace the interconnections between the political and media elites discourses, how the EU is framed in the media and how that reflects in public opinion. Um, so 
of course, the goal is not just to generate scholarship on this, although that's an important and lofty goal, but it's also to elaborate some suggestions for policymakers and to make some proposals on how these key challenges in the framing and in the representation of the European project can be addressed, right? What those key challenges are, we know already to some extent, uh, but of course we always need more research. Uh, I would say that as a researcher, but yet it's true. Um, but we also need to work out uh, constructive approaches to how to address challenges such as disinformation or you know, cybersecurity threats uh, or, or any other uh, challenges that we might uh, come upon as a result uh, of our project research. Um, so um, we know that you know, there are certain um, things that um, the European institutions are already struggling with. Um, so they've acknowledged that there is a rise of Euroscepticism across Europe. But on the other hand, uh, some of the more recent polls are also showing us that there's still quite a lot of positive developments and that the public in, in the European Union on the whole is quite positively uh, positioned towards uh, the European idea and the European project. And of course, you know, in, a lot of this uh, comes out of the current crisis that we're still experiencing, the, the public health crisis. But you know, the history of Europe is a cyclical history. So we go from crisis um, and uh, austerity to moments of prosperity and moments of hope. So it's really important for us to capture these cycles and to see how, how they impact on uh, what discourses are circulated in the media. Um, so we will do this by using a uh, comprehensive uh, mixed methods approach, which uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Tsuladze will talk about um, more in more detail. Uh, but I think it's important to us because we're an interdisciplinary team to, um, to bring all of our strength together and to combine qualitative, quantitative research methods and also deliberative research met methods, which engage the public in the process of our research. Um, and then to also combine that with policy interventions, um, because th this we know um, the best practice shows us that the best uh, and most impactful research uh, is a research that engages multiple stakeholders. So um, some of the things that uh, are on the menu for us over the next four years, um, and some of the things we are already working on, we're working on country case studies uh, that are going to be tracing those media discourses and their continuities and transformations. Um, and also tracing changes in perception um, of, you know, how, how they're shaped um, by the elites uh, and then how they go on to shape uh, public perception. Once our country case studies are complete, we'll also do some cross-country comparative analysis, uh, tracing some of the patterns and transformations um, in the broader European discursive sphere. And some of the things we hope to produce uh, are policy briefs and recommendations highlighting the key impacts of mediatized discourses on Europeanization, and also pointing to key threats and suggesting possible mechanisms of mitigation. And a big chunk of our work is going to also focus on public focused knowledge exchange. So things like producing podcasts, newsletters, um, staging events that involve a cross cut uh, or cross section of different stakeholders in each country um, to, to engage in that knowledge exchange and to enhance awareness of current discourses and myths around Europeanization, and also to see how they may differ um, in each of our project countries. And of course, um, we will strive to make all of our academic publications and other outputs open access because we believe that open access is uh, the only correct way to publish uh, H2020-funded research because uh, research results, you know, belong to uh, the European public, uh, and especially in our case, since they focus on, on the European public. So uh, just to sum up, you know, unsurprisingly, we believe that the future of Europe is heavily mediatized. Um, and as we know, there is a number of different European initiatives um, that acknowledge this. Uh, and more and more, we're seeing that media related issues uh, uh, and issues related to disinformation uh, or media regulation are becoming more and more prominent in uh, even the EU institutional discourse. So I think, again, this, for us, this points to the fact that, you know, we need to think about the future of Europe as a future where media play a huge role. Uh, 
Um, and uh, I think it's especially the fact that we especially especially started the project this year, which is also the year that the Conference on the Future of Europe is, is being held, um, means that we have this really unique opportunity um, to have a captive audience, so to speak, uh, to which we could talk about uh, the issues that we think are important uh, and to, the, um, you know, to, to, to bring to the fore uh, these really important debates about how media and media discourses can contribute to shaping the future of the European Union. Uh, and then that can, in, uh, in turn, uh, help chart a productive path forward. So with this roundtable, what we want to do is we want to begin this focused debate with stakeholders to contribute to a deeper understanding of how engaged citizens and informed policymaking can propel the European project forward towards a more inclusive, progressive and informed future. And just to promote some of our media channels, because we are a media focused project, I'll leave, the, I'll leave you there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tanya, for that for that introduction. It's a really exciting project because I think in like especially in journalistic parlance, we talk about the framing of the EU and we talk about it very anecdotally. So I think it's really important to have this kind of research. And I think that's why it's so exciting. So without further ado, as I said, we will hear from Dr. Leah Tuladze, who is going to give us a, 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 a sort of outline of exactly how the project is going to work. Her, 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 um, her, and that, her speech today is entitled A Discursive Performance of Europeanization: The Case of Georgia. Um, so the floor is yours, Dr. Tuladze. Um, are you there? Can, can we hear and see you? Yes, sure. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, and thanks to uh, Tanya for her comprehensive, comprehensive overview of the project. Uh, I will try to combine two aspects uh, today. One would be um, the brief overview of the research methodology that project is based on. And another one will be uh, the brief um, also summary of the main results gained from the similar research in Georgia. Uh, with using the similar methodology. So we do already have the experience of using this methodology, which proved to be very useful in the study of Europeanization. I would say it's a, not really a research, but two rounds of research conducted in Georgia, one from 2014 to 2016, uh, entitled Performing Europeanization, Political Vis-a-vis -vis Popular Discourses on Europeanization in Georgia. And another one, uh, a recent one, which was conducted from 2018 to 2020, and that has to do with um, um, basically the similar subject, uh, elite and popular discourses on Europeanization after Georgia was granted visa liberalization. So certain conditions have been changed. So how these conditions have been reflected on the uh, local uh, elite and popular discourses on Europeanization. Uh, so uh, the project uh, was based on the methodological triangulation, which we are going to apply in the current project. And here, um, Tanya didn't really go into detail because she uh, hoped that I would discuss that and I will say that we uh, currently are in the process of doing a, a let's say desk research or the analysis of the secondary data analyzing the existing work on um, related topics starting from the beginning of the 21st century and up to today and then the next round of research implies the analysis of media discourses, and it starts uh, next month in July, like very soon. And we will be um, closely monit monitoring and analyzing the discourses uh, by mostly pro, pro and anti-European uh, media. Uh, we have other types of classification, but basically what we are going to do to um, uh, just get the main idea of the discourses presented by the media, and we will, and this will be both traditional and new media, and we will focus on the content, both a qualitative and quantitative content analysis and discourse analysis, especially critical discourse analysis within the Foucauldian framework um, while analyzing this media discourses. The next stage would be the, uh, or will be the analysis, not would be, but will be definitely the analysis of uh, 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 as Tanya already said, the elites, uh, these are 
mostly political and um, media elites um, that um, are opinion makers, let's say, and that greatly shape the opinions of the population and how these opinions are mediated through the media. We already know from the previous former stage of the research. Uh, so here we will apply a completely new and innovative methodology, which has been applied only once in the study of Euro uh, Europeanization by the MaxCap research team funded by the EU. And uh, in contrast to this team, uh, we will apply not a traditional um, a traditional Q methodology approach, but will in, enrich it with an innovative perspective that, uh, let's say, is invented by us. And I will go back to this in a moment. And finally, uh, the very last uh, stage of the research, uh, I mean, empirical research here, because later we will also have discussions with policymakers, the final empirical stage of the research will, will be the uh, uh, nationwide representative surveys with the population in the target seven countries. So this is the end of the empirical part, and then we will we'll have extensive discussions with population through uh, deliberative discussions and also um, policymakers, uh, both at the local and EU level. So we have great plans for the next four years and hope we'll manage to um, uh, like uh, follow our <laughs> aspirations. Uh, now, coming back to the research method, um, as I said, uh, we use a methodological triangulation uniting qualitative and quantitative research methods, and that we have already uh, applied similar approach in the Georgian research. Uh, what I want to especially uh, um, stress here is that uh, during the first round of the Georgian research conducted in 2014 uh, to 16, we uh, targeted these three, exactly three um, uh, main players, let's say. This is um, um, elites, um, uh, media, and population. Um, while in the next round, which is the recent one, unfortunately, we did not analyze media discourses, but we did target elite, uh, like political and media, uh, political and intellectual elites, like wider, not only media, but other intellectual elites and population. And here, in this very research, we have integrated Q methodology. Uh, as I said, Q methodology is a quantitative approach, and here we usually give pre-formulated uh, pre statements to the research participants uh, the, from the most popular uh, uh, discourses that circulate in respective societies. So uh, we give pro this pre-formulated um, discourses and ask the participants to um, rate them on a um, special Q grid. And uh, research participants um, um, provide, uh, basically rate these discourses, and then we do a correlation and factor analysis of these discourses. But in contrast to this traditional use of Q methodology, we took a further step and decided to integrate uh, it with in-depth interviews that have been already the case in the recent Georgian research. Namely, we asked the uh, respondents to also provide the rationale for uh, rating their statements in a particular way. And here they basically use the two criteria for rating their uh, statements, which is uh, the agreement, disagreement to the statements, uh, and at the same time, the assessment of their importance or unimportance. So, they were also asked to comment on the rationale and their narratives resulted in rather comprehensive in-depth interviews with elites and also quite comprehensive discussions in the focus groups conducted with the population residing in the main cities of eastern and western Georgia. So what did this uh, research show? And here we come finally to the discursive performance of Europeanization, uh, because this research has uh, revealed that their discourses on Europeanization, both elite and popular discourses on Europeanization, are um, rather ambivalent. And here, uh, when I say they are ambivalent, I mean two major factors that are considered important in the study of Europeanization or in, this, in the um, understanding of what factors do have an impact on the 
uh, elites and populations perceptions of Europeanization. And the uh, scholarly literature offers two such clusters or fa of factors, which is pragmatic and uh, identity factors. The pragmatic factors have to do with benefits stemming from a country's, any country's Europeanization process, while identity considerations, of course, have to do with the perceived uh, impact of Europeanization on national identity and traditions. So usually, um, as it might be expected, pragmatic factors are uh, related to more positive expectations because it's pragmatic, it's beneficial after all, while uh, identity considerations um, uh, uh, have to do with uh, like more uh, threats or fears stemming from the Europeanization um, process in terms of um, uh, uh, affecting the local identity and traditions. However, in contrast to the uh, widespread expectations, our research has shown that both uh, pragmatic and identity factors related to Europeanization uh, invoke uh, Georgian elite and populations rather ambivalent discourses on Europeanization. Just to start from the pragmatic factors, as they were rated on a Q grid by elites and population, because their assessments were quite close to each other, the most important pragmatic factor that they saw as, a, as an outcome of Georgia's Europeanization was uh, the impact of Europeanization on the protection of human rights, which uh, was viewed in a positive light. It was an ultimate positive uh, poll, which means that they did expect the um, uh, positive impact of European uh, integration on the protection of human rights in Georgia. The next two important factors uh, or rather statements that were, lo were located on the positive, ultimate positive poll, were uh, the impact of Europe and positive impact of European Union on uh, Georgia's economic development, especially in terms of free trade relations and its outcomes. Uh, and the next uh, important factor uh, viewed in the programmatic light was the impact of European Union on the protection of Georgia's security. In particular, uh, the European Union was viewed as uh, Georgia's main safeguard against Russian threats. Uh, concerning the identity factor, it occupied uh, the ultimate negative pole. We had the statement uh, uh, that George, uh, alongside uh, European uh, integration, uh, Georgian traditions will be threatened. And it occupied the negative, ultimate negative poll means that uh, both elites and population did not fear that um, any negative effects uh, will uh, result from the European integration in terms of uh, 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 local identity and traditions. However, despite this positive stance, we can still ra see rather ambivalent views, uh, especially expressed through their um, comments and narratives stemming from this, um, uh, uh, let's say, from, from the uh, following discussion uh, after this Q, Q ratings. Uh, that is, um, starting from the pragmatic factors, despite the fact that they thought that European Union uh, will have a positive impact on the protection of human rights in Georgia. At the same time, they uh, believed that Georgia, and I'm quoting now, uh, now my respondents, are uh, traditionally tolerant, or it is characterized by inborn tolerance, and that we do not need to be taught from outside uh, by the EU. And uh, concerning the economic benefits, despite the fact that they believe that uh, European Union uh, integration will result in uh, economic development of the country and most positive economic outcomes, at the same time, they doubt that Georgian uh, products can really establish on the European market and that free trade area will be beneficial to Georgia. And finally, concerning the Russian threats, uh, despite hoping to be protected by the European Union, uh, and still the respondents, both elites and population, and I stress that that's both because usually we uh, encounter a rather positive um, uh, re uh, um, like speech by our politicians about the role of European Union ag um, uh, against uh, Russian threats. Uh, so uh, here uh, um, they say, uh, yes, uh, we hope that we will 
be um, protected by the European Union, but at the same time, they doubt that uh, um, the European Union will further compl complicate its already complex relations with Russia because of small and minor Georgia, and therefore they uh, think that we should not really expect any uh, any safeguarding uh, from the European Union when it comes to uh, Russia's further occupation of the Georgian territories. Concerning the uh, identity factor, here we also have uh, rather ambivalent discourses because a Georgian state, both elites and population, that um, Georgia decided to follow the so-called European values much earlier than before it started, before it thought even of integrating with the European Union, and therefore it naturally belongs to the European family. However, at the same time, they fear that what they call European liberal values will uh, um, have a negative impact on Georgian family traditions. So we see that these discourses regarding pragmatic and identity factors are rather ambivalent and contradictory. However, I should say, which actually uh, gives us the impression of this discursive manipulation or discursive performance. However, I would say that this discursive uh, performance becomes even more prominent when we uh, move to the discussion of the Europeanization strategies or mechanisms. Uh, and here again, uh, from the uh, scholarly literature, we know two such mechanisms. The one uh, of conditionality, this is one pole, and another pole is occupied by socialization. So conditionality is basically related to the uh, um, reward and punishment system um, used by the EU to promote a certain reforms in a particular country. Uh, while socialization is an, uh, occupies a, a contrary, like contradictory pole because it uh, because it implies not uh, the reward and punishment system, but uh, the country's own will to follow certain European norms because they are simply considered uh, beneficial to the uh, local reality. Uh, therefore, these two uh, strategies are uh, uh, it, um, probably contradictory, yes, and um, exclusive uh, because you cannot uh, be uh, dictated from outside and at the same time um, be guided by internal motivation. But in Georgia's understanding, that's possible. And that's one of the most uh, prominent cases of discursive performance because to quote again my respondents, um, European norms and standards represent that enforced mechanism that Georgia should voluntarily implement in order to become an EU member country. So we call this in our research the enforced socialization. Um, and this enforced socialization once again confirms uh, this this uh, vision of this enforced socialization once again confirms that the rhetorical performance is an inseparable part of the elite and popular discourses on Europeanization in Georgia. I will stop here because I took a lot of time. And yes, I will be glad to take the questions. Thank you. It's fascinating though. Don't worry about taking the time when you're, when you're saying interesting things, I think. Um, I think it's so interesting as well. I mean, there's, you just can't talk about framing of the EU without thinking of how other things are framed and how other media is pushed. I think it's so interesting and Georgia is just at the very sort of apex crux point of that sort of that sort of framing and that sort of idea. Uh, I'm sure there will be questions for you. Feel free to start putting them in the chat or on, on, or on Twitter as well. We are now going to head to Kieran O'Driscoll and Stephen O'Shea uh, from the European Movement in Ireland. I don't know who of you is going to speak first but I will let you unmute yourselves and get going with your Perfect, thanks so much for that, Jack. Just, uh, me speaking first, um, and I'll just uh, share my screen because I have a holding slide and uh, I have some lovely data to share with everyone later with our Red Sea poll uh, from just this year. Um, so I should, ex uh, so just let everyone, oh, uh, pardon me. I won't share my screen just for the moment because I have a script that I would like to stick through, so I'd like to <laughs> ensure we all get through this. Um, so as uh, Jack said, uh, my name is Kieran Andruskel. I'm the P Policy and Research Officer from European Movement Ireland. My colleague, uh, Stephen O'Shea, who's Deputy CEO, will be speaking just a little bit later, so I'll be just in introducing myself with a few things. I'll be speaking briefly about the role of EMI and then Ireland's EU agenda, and then looking at uh, some data from our Ireland and the EU 
um, opinion poll, uh, particularly looking at just that this year. Um, on the role of European Movement Ireland, uh, our mission is to develop and deepen the connection between Irish society and Europe. Uh, we aim to achieve greater public understanding of and engagement uh, with the European Union. Uh, we do this by providing objective information and by stimulating debate. Our aim is to reach a wide range of uh, audiences throughout Ireland and we uh, cooperate with the government and with like-minded organisations. Hence why both myself and Stephen are very happy to be joining you all today. Uh, so that's just a brief overlay of uh, who we are. And uh, of course, the meat of, of today, of course, uh, what we'll be talking about will be Ireland's EU agenda. Uh, Ireland retains a, a very high level of support and can, for continued membership of the EU. Uh, in EU Ireland's uh, 2021 Ireland and EU poll from Red Sea, a total of 84% of uh, those surveys supported Ireland remaining in the EU. Um, uh, the stronger support uh, for Ireland's continued membership uh, underscores how Ireland clearly views its future as being within the EU, a position that is well understood and appreciated in the EU. Indeed, many of the factors that brought Ireland to join what was then the EEC in 1973 still bear heavily today, such as di diversification of trade and markets away from the UK, uh, to being on an equal footing with powerful member states, to finding shelter and anchor in the world through our EU membership. Just to highlight uh, Irish trade data over the course of our membership from Ireland's Central uh, Statistics Office in 1973, upon joining the then EEC, the UK accounted for 51% of Irish exports. In 2019, the kind of last normal year for kind of trade data, that dropped to just 10%. And I do believe, I think for uh, last year, uh, it dropped further below to 9%. Over the same period, trade to other EU member states grew from 21% of Irish exports to 48% in 2019. Ireland has benefit, benefited from our membership of the EU, such as access, access to the single market, to the EU's role as uh, the world's leading trade bloc. However, due to Ireland traditionally receiving significant amounts of structural funding over the years, membership was often viewed purely as a transactional relationship. So going beyond that, it's harder to quantify um, EU rules around environment or data, data protections versus how much money, for example, farmers are going to get. This does pose challenges uh, around engaging uh, the Irish public ab um, about what the EU is doing. The strong public support for our EU membership cannot be taken for granted, in particular as we move into the post-Brexit phase of the EU-UK relationship, or as I like to call it, Brexit eternal. While negotiations pushed and pulled all of our tensions at different times, uh, it brought EU affairs firmly front and centre in Ireland due to the challenges Brexit posed to this country. And by the EU publicly and so very often uploading Ireland's concerns throughout the negotiations, it was a key factor behind the Brexit bounce in support for the EU, as we'll see a little later in our Ireland and the EU poll. However, while pressing issues remain around the Northern Ireland Protocol that will keep it within the public eye in Ireland, there are other big ticket issues on the EU's agenda that, um, that are often more important than Brexit from the perspective of, our, of other EU member states and the institutions as well. And the challenge here is how to maintain that engagement with the Irish public in the EU uh, on EU issues that do not relate to Brexit to help guide Ireland's priorities at the EU as part of the Future of Europe process that was organised in the wake of Brexit and other challenges that the EU is facing in 2016 the Irish government in November 2017 launched a series of citizens dialogues uh, on the future of Europe in which European Movement Ireland was the lead organisation in that process. Similar to the ongoing conference in the future of Europe, the views of people were, were heard and taken on board in roundtable discussions around Ireland. Throughout the citizens dialogues, people spoke of how they want to be part uh, of an EU that continues to do what it does well, but also is ready to meet the challenges uh, that, uh, that we now face and are and that we are better uh, off facing together. Most of all, they spoke of how they want to be part of an EU that is fair. Coming from this, the Irish government outlined five priorities for Ireland under the EU's strategic agenda for 2019 to 2024. And these include uh, a stronger uh, uh, economy with more jobs, societies enabled to empower and protect, a secure energy and climate future, uh, a trusted area of fundamental freedoms, and effective joint action in the world. These five issues highlight how so many of Ireland's priorities align with the EU across many of these broad policy areas. Uh, but while that is the case, bringing the Irish population along in terms of engagement and issues that relate and impact their lives 
is vital to ensure they are informed and engaged about the EU. So now we'd just like to just briefly uh, zip line through um, some uh, uh, data that uh, we have uh, from our um, uh, Red Sea poll that we conducted. Um, if it will move, that would be lovely. There we go. So uh, the first one uh, relates to the, way, the, uh, the main question that we've asked nearly every single year is uh, um, Ireland should remain part of the EU. And this goes back from 2013 uh, up until just this year. Uh, and you can see it is all, uh, it is very, very high. And when I spoke of the Brexit bounce, it pushed that uh, numbers even higher. Uh, so you can see, you know, um, uh, uh, kind of from 2016 onwards, it does tick up um, upwards. But now, particularly last year and this year, we see almost a return to normal high levels of that kind of 84%, 85%. Um, For me, it's uh, because um, for 2021, uh, and particularly for last year, uh, and for this year with everything in terms of COVID, uh, we do wonder, will this impact the data or not? Particularly last year, the field work was was conducted uh, the week of the first week of lockdown in Ireland. So uh, it'd be interesting to see next year how that impacts. Uh, the other question that we have a, a, long, a, a long time series over is around should Ireland be part of increased EU defence and security cooperation? And again, uh, the issue of um, uh, de- uh, defence in, in, in particular, particular around Irish neutrality is um, uh, an issue that has appeared again and again in terms of any referendum that has taken place in Ireland around EU treaties over the years. And it's always an issue to kind of protect and maintain it. So it's always a, a particular issue of concern uh, for, for Ireland in terms of uh, when it comes to the EU. Uh, so you can see again last year, again for 2020, it, the kind of support did uh, dip quite a, a good bit, but has recovered this year. And again, we wonder again for next year, will that recover, recovery continue um, or will some other, will other issue, uh, issues happen around the uh, disagree and don't knows because it's an ongoing debate uh, in, in uh, Ireland. Uh, one question, uh, again, which is kind of Brexit related, uh, uh, as many have said that uh, because of Brexit, it has kind of brought forward uh, any kind of timeline around uh, possible United Ireland. Uh, so we have uh, started to pose this question. We just um, started last year. And you can see very little has changed over the last year. A slight increase of disagree from 42 to 43. But again, um, uh, this is a, um, uh, kind of, an, again, a kind of a, just with security defence, this is ongoing debate within Ireland. And I think it's going to be uh, kicking up gears as time goes on, as we look towards, you know, how can the Irish state prepare for it, what needs to happen and everything else. But it's kind of just at its infancy. Um, but it's something that this particular data that we'll, we'll be collecting down the line, I'll be interested to see, again, how this goes on four or five years down the line. Uh, on COVID, because, you know, <laughs> what, what else can we talk about, really? Um, there's two questions we've asked here. That the blue is from last year and the orange is from this year. Uh, and again, both are asked in, in, at the exact same period of time in kind of mid-March. Uh, initially, the one for last year, the, you know, the EU has responded well to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we we pose as thinking, well, we'll put this in because we won't be talking about it for very long more by the summer, and turns out <laughs> that is not the case. But it's interesting when you compare it to the question we asked this year, I have confidence in the EU vaccine strategy. They're both very much the same. And again, they're both victims of time. In 2020, the big thing sticking out in terms of the EU's response to the pandemic was um, around kind of the lack of solidarity shown with Italy that particular time in the late, late February, early March, which was very much in people's minds. And then in March, and then again for this year, also in March, the vaccine strategy in Ireland at the time, I think in most places, it was very slow to kick off. So again, had these questions been asked in June of the uh, respective years, there would have been a very much different um, uh, uh, perspective. I expect a higher sense of agree in most cases. And again, just my fine one, because with the uh, with the ongoing conference on the future of Europe, which European Movement Ireland is very much involved in, um, uh, we wanted to ask a question this year around kind of you know companies around around health, with the, which which the EU has kind of previously had very little involved in. So we asked the question: uh, In order to deal with crises such as COVID nineteen, Ireland and other member states should give the EU more control over health policy, even if they lose some control on the national level. And uh, we're a bit surprised with this because in other kind of separate opinion polls across the EU away from the Eurobarometer, it was also very, very high, even in places like Italy, where, yes, we do want the EU to have a greater role, particularly around crises like COVID-19. But in Ireland, uh, it's a very salient issue um, uh, in terms of our national politics. And you can see there are 49% of people disagreed with it. Um, And again, last year in our general election, it was that big issue that people talked about was housing and uh, health were the two big issues. 
and an opinion poll from the Irish Times Brexit, I think, featured, a, I think, as a, as a voting issue by about two or three percent of people. So EU issues, not that much, not getting much engagement. It's always those um, domestic national issues. And that is where I leave myself and I shall um, uh, turn off my mic as I hand over to my colleague Stephen O'Shea. Hi everyone, um, I'm Stephen, I'm the Kieran's colleague and the Deputy CEO of European Movement here in Ireland. Um, just as a former um, graduate of the School of Journalism in DCU, I'm very I'm particularly happy um, to be here. So Kieran has, has, has given an overview of um, some of the, the work which we do, which is evident is around citizen engagement on um, Irish European issues. And of course, in order to, to do that work, well and to bring it to the largest possible audience we seek and try to amplify it um, through the media so that is the kind of practitioner perspective um, I will I will bring today um, but also before um, I was in this role I, I have worked as a political spokesperson in Ireland for um, seven or eight years as well so I'll, I'll bring some pers perspectives from that um, also but if we look at the Irish case of how um, the Irish media covers the EU, it's down to very often a question of resources. So this is a country of 4.5 million people or more, contributes in 20, contributed in 2020, 2.7 billion to the EU budget, received about 2.4 billion, and has two correspondents based in Brussels, um, which I, I, I think is quite a telling number. Generally coverage tends to focus on issues of national importance or perceived national importance, and a big factor here is the consumption of UK media, um, be it the BBC or UK newspapers, um, and, um, and the perception or the reception of information about the EU through those channels um, is also a factor in Ireland. And I would say that there is a small consumption of European um, um, media outlets for reasons of both distance and language. And if we just to pick up on some of the, the poll findings that Kieran outlined, I mean, one of the big things we, we do with that poll is we try to secure media publicity for it, um, um, it to, to amplify the messages that are that are that arise. And I suppose the, the interesting point there is that we you know, everybody does this, but we present the findings in a way that aims to capture media's attention. So. The media does not dictate the questions that we asked and the, ask in the polling, but we do highlight findings that we think will, is, will interest media and ensure coverage. So over the last few years, just looking back, coverage is focused on things like the numbers favourable towards EU membership, the EU response to COVID-19, corporation tax and defence, all issues of national concern. But issues that we also conducted research on that received little or no attention include migration, enlargement, trade, rule of law and climate. And so I, I think a key point is that all organisations and institutions seek to that seek to amplify their message via the media frame their work in a way that they think will appeal to it. And this, depending on your perspective, can create either a virtuous or vicious circle whereby it's not just the media choosing what to cover that can impact citizens' percep perceptions. It's also organizations seeking the coverage, framing their work in a way to appeal to the media. So, so that is very often what the nexus where the issues that enter public discourse come from. Um, it is both the choices in coverage and the choice that organizations make at an earlier stage. I just wanted to make some broader sort of observations from from our perspective about the changing dynamics um, in media and how how this may affect some of of, of your work um, in in analyzing these issues i mean it, it even since i graduated from dcu in 2008 it, it has changed remarkably and when i began working in politics i mean the way to amplify your message was quite simple you secured coverage in newspapers or on television or on radio but this has become much more difficult and many organizations now deploy, deploy a kind of a hybrid method of pursuing publicity through traditional media as they did before, combined with some sort of digital media capability. 
And those two things tend to remain somewhat separate. But that isn't how people consume news. They take their news from a variety of sources and make no distinction between traditional or digital. So for practitioners like ourselves, I think the puzzle of aligning how to amplify a message with people's consumption patterns has yet to be solved. And I think fragmentation is one of the reasons that this has occurred and probably has made it more difficult to conceptualize what the media actually is today and what constitutes um, the media. Um, and, I, and I think you know, one of the other big changes that I just want to highlight today is in the business model. And I won't go into a long discussion on the viability um, of the media industry or, or, the, or its economics. But, but I think one important point is the age demographic of journalists. And I would contend that reduced salaries uh, has, by and large, contributed to the declining age profile of journalism. It's increasingly a young person's profession because pay is bad and conditions are poor in many cases. Kevin Rafter in DCU actually has done some research on this. And there's the, you also then have this demographic cliff edge in journalism, whereby many people leave the, leave the profession mid-career to take up more stable or lucrative roles. So you're left with the majority of, young, of journalists being young, which can be a good thing, but I think it also raises concerns about the about the industry's ability to contextualize new stories if the experience within the industry tends to leave it um, mid or later career. And another point that I have, another issue I think that I have come across as well, and it might be an interesting one to pursue, is I, I think that many young many journalists. Now, because of declining salaries, supplement their primary income from other sources. So a newspaper or online reporter might appear on ten of television panel shows, particularly in political journalism. And to be invited to take part in these opportunities, you, you know, need to have an original, dare I say, a contrarian take on the issues in question. And it may be the case that some journalists position their coverage or their social media takes in a way that attracts invitations to secondary um, platforms. So I think, you know, business models are under severe pressure. Consumers are fickle uh, in, in terms of where, where they source news. And of course, then the other issue is, of course, is that, you know, media is under attack from governments and political systems within some parts of the European Union. So I think this leaves us with questions surrounding conceptualizing what actually constitutes media in Europe today or who constitutes it and, 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 and then how fit for purpose it is vis-a-vis -vis, uh, citizen and public um, discourse. And you know, some of this, some of these issues uh, are contributing, among with among any, many others, to the disinformation phenomenon. Something, and it's something that, which is something we've done a bit of work on um, at European Movement. And I, I think the EU is particularly susceptible to or vulnerable to disinformation because of its distance, both physically and conceptually from citizens. Um, I think it differs in national to national authorities in that regard, because I think for citizens, they rely on information rather than experience to inform them about the European Union. And I think the important point about disinformation is that it's a two way process. It's not just doesn't just require a sender it requires an audience. And I think it's ultimately about the health of the ecosystem in which the media operates and in which information about the EU is communicated. And I, I think the ecosystem um, uh, example is, 
is, is an important way to think about it, that all parts of the system have to be healthy in order for the entire ecosystem to work. And so therefore I think the response to this information must be broad, but a big part of that must be supporting a healthy media-based system um, uh, that is has quality journalism at its core because you we 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 can't i think it's difficult to analyze how the media frames or impacts citizens discourse without actually looking at its ability and health um in order to do that um and i think you know i would uh, you know also have to say i i think as part of that broad response ngos such as ourselves and other civil society uh, groups you know often have remit to counter your remits or interests rather in countering disinformation. And, you know, one of our uh, uh, roles is to be a trusted and factual source of information related to EU issues um, in Ireland. And so that's an important pillar in that response as well. And I think often civil society and media organizations can work quite constructively together. I think, you know, the International Crisis Group or Human Rights Watch or organizations like that do that particularly well. Um, and so that, poten that potential partnership between media and civil society um, um, may also be another important aspect um, in, in better um, um, ensuring the health of that ecosystem um, that I spoke about. So I suppose the, the key point that I will leave you with is, is which is, is my own contention, is I think the rapid evolution of the media industry, of media consumption, of, uh, and of the associated factors makes this conception, certainly to me, makes, it, makes this conception of actually what constitutes media today difficult and then therefore makes assessing its impact on citizens perceptions quite difficult also um so i i'll leave it there and, and look forward to your questions Stephen, you've hit so many of my own personal nerves as, as a brussels correspondent with some of that stuff firstly the idea of young journalist payment and everything but i remember arriving here at a summit and somebody saying saying something that had happened. I can't remember the exact story. It was about Ukraine, I think. I remember saying to him, how do you know that? And he said he was in a sort of maybe mid forties Italian journalist. He was like, I was here when it happened. I was very green, very fresh in Brussels. And it blew my mind that, you know, you actually have to experience things in order to go forward. And also it's very interesting when you talk about Irish media, when you talk about the correspondents that are here, Tony Connolly, for instance, is one of the most respected journalists probably in Europe, I would argue, but also he has a receptive platform in Ireland where people will listen to the things he says, whereas perhaps correspondents from other media do not have that. They don't get their voice. It's a, it's a two-way thing. It's, it's really, really interesting. Okay, so um, thank you so much to all our speakers. I personally find that fascinating um, and I'm sure our, our, our participants did as well. We will open the floor to questions. If you have any questions, raise your raise your hand um, and you can you can speak uh, if you if you wish. I will follow them. We have John Worth uh, been in, in the chat saying the cynic would say Brussels has two whole media houses, uh, Politico and Euroactive based pretty much on this, where more or less all the journalism, all the income comes from non-journalism. I think this is a really interesting aspect. And as journalists, we've, we're very aware of where money is coming from in wherever we're working. Um, I, suppose, I suppose this is a question directly, uh, well, maybe, maybe let's, let's bring, in, bring in Leah actually. Uh, how, um, in, in a country like Georgia, I know this way you, you do your research, but perhaps you can speak more broadly. How do we make sure um, that the framing of EU discussions is not influenced by the money that is paying for independent journalism, which obviously needs, needs to happen, or any journalism. Okay, thank you for the question. I would say that we cannot make sure, while the other way around, we know that um, 
quite large media outlets are funded by certain groups with political interests. And we definitely know which media outlet, especially when it comes to television, belongs to which political party or pol political interest groups. So we can, uh, even without uh, watching certain like TV programs uh, on this very channel, we can expect what discourses will be presented by this media outlets. So um, we actually, we are working on this desk research uh, at the moment. And we one of the parts of this desk research document is the media financing. And we have uh, like Transparency International Georgia um, has been doing this research extensively. Media Foundation um, media uh, has been doing this research extensively. So we do have this data, who funds whom, for, since what time, and how that reflects on the discourses provided by various media. So th th that would be part of our research. And we are almost done with our research report, and which will be available in two months uh, for public use, I guess. Thank you. Th thank you, Leah. Um, so I, I also want, just uh, as a point from me, I've, I actually think it's really important that journalists know where the money's coming from as well. I find that something that is, um, I find it, I, I don't enjoy talking to reporters and correspondents who are not thinking about budgets, are not thinking about money, are not aware of where their money is coming from because it's, it's important to be independent, but also to know, I think it's a, it's a weird situation that we as journalists uh, sort of, you know, straddle. Okay, so, we ha so Samuel has a question for Stephen. Uh, do you have any examples, uh, deliberation and citizens' involvement, of, I think of how um, deliberation and citizens' involvement can lower disinformation, potentially, and shape discourses on Europe, EU, among citizens, in the media. He asked the question because it's a four-year project, obviously, the EU Media Ties will also have a citizens panel component, and it would be interesting to better understand. So, Stephen, I wonder if you can, if you can ask that. Um, yeah, I, I just, so one of the things that we, we, have, we have started literally last week um, is our, is some European movement are running citizen, citizens panels um, on behalf of the Irish government on the Conference of the Future of, of Europe. Um, so we had did our first one last Wednesday, um, last Thursday rather, and and the approach we take to to that. So so we're very conscious that we are we are running these citizens panels on behalf of the government. The government are the funder and the contracted partner there, but we do strive to maintain some some distance as well and to make sure and ensure that the information that we present as part of that process. So uh, briefing papers, um, slide decks, the questions that we pose are um, as independent and factual as we can make it. So how did we do that in this process? We conducted our, our own initial research into the particular issues that we are talking about, climate, economy, um, health, uh, 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 and others. And we went to a group of academics um, and engaged with them then on those issues. And they provide that sort of level of independent verification um, around the information that we, pro we provide as part of that process. So, so I, I think, and, and the people who are engaged with us within those panels know that. So I think providing that level of transparency and verification around information, which is something that journalists do all the time, is, is very important in terms of establishing trust between you and the people you are dealing with, be they citizens, be they elites, whoever they, they are, that, they, that, that where you are coming from is a position of, of transparency and that there is no suspicion of, of any um, hidden kind of agenda. So um, that is um, one example of a project that we are, we are engaged with at the moment. So uh, uh, following on from that, I suppose for you, Tanya, if I can bring you in, um, with this mediatized project looking at the European Union, in four years time, when people are reading the details of the research, four years is quite a long time and it's good that it's a long time. But I wonder if you can predict or project how you expect maybe the media landscape to have changed. We've just had, today's a really interesting day when we talk about EU media. It's five years since the Brexit referendum, which was all about how, I, I don't want to talk about Brexit too much, but it was all about how 
um, the EU was framed in the United Kingdom. A lifelong of framing on me, I felt, growing up there. What do you expect will change over the course of the project? What do you hope to, or what do you hope to change, perhaps? Well, I think there, there's two sort of, or more, more than two parts to, to the answer to this question. I think, first of all, to say that even though the project is four years long, we will be releasing various bits of findings and you know, research outputs throughout the project. Perhaps, maybe, maybe not a, a, a bit this year, but definitely more in year two and three and four, um, because you know, waiting four years for all the results is is just uh, ridiculous, and nobody will stick with us for that long. Um, but I think our ultimate goal is to show that you know it is a very complex uh, system, it's a, or ecosystem, where there are many different players and many different um, influencers who shape. Uh, or can shape uh, the discourse um, about the EU and around the EU in the media. And what we want to show is, you know, what are those dynamics and, and are there differences from, from country to country and are there any broader patterns that we can spot? Uh, what are those forces, right? And I think in four years, a lot will change. Um, you know, first of all, obviously we're not probably not going to be in the same crisis mode as, as we have been in the, in the past year and a half uh, because of all the public health uh, difficulties. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see whether that will, um, whether this will be kind of a period of recovery, um, you know, into, and how that will shape uh, the, the public trust um, towards the EU. But of course, you know, the media coverage has just greatly contributed to shaping um, people's perceptions of, you know, how helpful it is to be part of the EU or not helpful, you know, uh, when it directly impacts uh, when you're getting your vaccination or, um, you know, what kind of uh, medical assistance you can count on. So I think even, even that small chunk of it uh, will definitely change and we'll see some, I think, some pretty direct impacts. But as you say, there, there are lots of other competing ad, uh, agenda factors. There's Brexit, uh, right? And I think in the next four years, it'll become probably increasingly more obvious, like what the post-Brexit moment will look like, uh, both for the EU and for the UK. Because as you say, right now, we're still kind of in the throes of it. Uh, you know, we, we have been kind of since since 2016. Um, but I think we will see in the next four years uh, how it, the, that dust will start to settle and how that will also shape perceptions uh, of, of the European project. Um, but, you know, there might be new challenges that we don't anticipate, but I think we're going to be dealing with the things we are still dealing with now, anything from public health to, um, you know, migration issues to um, international security, cybersecurity. I think we're going to see a lot more um, cybersecurity issues are going to be become even more even more prominent. Uh, I mean, given the, the spate of recent ransomware attacks, I mean, Ireland has just had a devastating spate of attacks on our health service. So you can imagine our health service is like doubly traumatized now because they're dealing with the pandemic and they just dealt with a huge ransomware attack. But we've seen these things happening across Europe. Uh, so I think all of these issues will continue to shape people's perceptions. But as, as Stephen has pointed out, it's also going to be really interesting to see how the internal dynamics in the media market will contribute to, to you know, how those ideas will be presented to the public. Uh, and whether or not it will be influenced by the political situation in some of the EU countries, because we're, we're also seeing some discrepancies emerging. Uh, you know, there's the situation, for instance, in Hungary and Poland, uh, and then, you know, the, the reaction from the rest of the EU to, to those, uh, those changes that are happening. So there's lots of different factors. And I think part of our, like our gargantuan task is to capture all of those factors and to see how they um, how they contribute to, to those, those media discourses uh, in each country and whether or not we can see some overarching trends uh, and some overarching influences uh, that, you know, kind of stretch across countries and that aren't just, it, that, so something is not just a national discourse, but it's also a kind of a pan-European trend, perhaps. And those trends might be in the media discourses themselves. They might also be in you know, how independent journalism is faring overall in the EU, and also, you know, in the number of Brussels correspondents that uh, each country can afford to have. So, I, yeah, I think, you know, th there's, there's multiple possibilities. And so really, I think our task will be just to, to, 
to try and, and focus on the most important ones and to, to, to see how to communicate them to the public, to the policymakers um, in, a, in a constructive way, but also in a way that is not confusing, but instead clarifying uh, and adds to the transparency of this discussion. Totally agree. I think it's, it's, it's going to be so interesting over the next few years. Kieran, I'm going to bring you in. Um, to, I have a friend, a mate of mine, Dave Keating, who's a, who's a correspondent here, who always, always berates and bemoans and goes on about the fact that certain countries, specifically British media in Brussels, um, have a massive weight on how it goes, how they're sort of the centralised media that have pushed so much in other countries, perhaps because linguistically uh, English is sort of the lingua franca in Brussels uh, despite the French efforts against that um, <laughs> but but I, I wonder how I wonder if you can discuss I mean when you're when you're doing your research obviously it's based in Ireland but if you have any ad advice for the researchers as part of this project about how they look at the influence that comes out from from sort of big hitters even French media or German media um, that really affects perhaps the media in other smaller member states um, I think probably the biggest thing to always, well, from an Irish perspective, it is always, as Stephen said, the, the, the voices in London always seem to drown out um, in, uh, in terms of the analysis or coverage sometimes. So it's gets you have to like literally look beyond uh, England to see what is coming from Brussels. Uh, and, and very often the case, um, while uh, because of language issues in Ireland, where we're kind of generally not very good for picking up kind of other European languages, uh, we don't kind of read up more in terms of other news sources, but there's a wealth there of, you know, maybe kind of national EU um, uh, media organizations that have kind of English outlets. So like Die Welt or France 24, you know, generally kind of international perspectives, so not just covering EU issues. So there are ones which, um, you know, people can easily take it. And of course, your news, which, uh, you know, uh, going back uh, even to the 90s, watching before school was something that was like very much present and evident. And that was only the case because it was available on RTE, the main uh, state broadcaster at that hour of the morning. Um, so it is a case of, um, uh, you know, moving away from what is the, you know, this is the case for Ireland where so much we relied on the UK for a lot of things, so maybe it might have been previously uh, uh, maybe with policy issues with, the, with uh, the UK, but of course now with the media it was always a, a big thing where there was so much, there was so much uh, uh, coverage there, but like from from like in terms of like the, the broader uh, debate here today about kind of you know engaging with uh, the Irish society and with EU issues uh, because in Ireland it's very hyper localized particularly with politics um, and just right now there is a by-election taking place in Dublin uh, um, and it's all about you know you know knocking on doors shaking hands you know pressing leaflets into other people's hands which um, contrasts to where like in France with their local elections just last week uh, canvassing just does not ha happen so I was quite surprised that it was kind of a unique thing to Ireland. So things are quite uh, hyper localized. So um, uh, in terms of Ireland, you almost would have like, you know, bring the EU and kind of sit it in front of people in terms of like what happens in, in the local area. An example of that is what we do um, every month uh, in the Cork newspaper, uh, the Evening Echo, um, we have a, a, an article and what we're trying to do is highlight what is the EU doing in Cork and it generally relates to like, where is the money going? Um, and it's and often cases it's kind of uh, so much with the EU it's almost kind of sitting behind in terms of what's happening uh, uh, on the local level. And like one example that comes to mind uh, is that um, a small offshore island, Bear Island, they have received EU funding in partnership with the University College Cork on a, on a, on a Horizon 2020 project, which helped fund a community radio station, uh, which started up in 2019, where I think not many people were listening into it, but it came to the fore with, uh, starting from March last year with the pandemic, where, uh, like the big thing, they, you know, they were able to listen to mass every Sunday when it was being broadcasted, but also they were able to speak to other islanders who are living around the world or connections, or it's, uh, and it's, it's kind of branched out where it's kind of, they're linking up with um, other areas and other islands like uh, Cape Clear Island, and Shirkin Island, also in West Cork, and also helping to kind of, you know, speaking to other people um, and, and other the peninsulas like Nissan and Sheepshead, but also they're linking them with other kind of EU organizations. So there's an uh, there's a European Islands Association where they have regularly bring on people each week to talk about, you know, what are they doing to kind of improve their own situation and highlighting very similar concerns around, you know, tourism and living, uh, uh, living and childcare and everything else. So it's, uh, it's, it's with that example where you have to go down to the granular level in the Irish setting anyway of like, you know, what is the EU doing to kind of highlight it, highlight it 
and because people are we like to hear the stories that we can relate to that you know someone up the road has you know been able to do something with eu funding or there's some project that has helped the local school and everything else so that's where it's uh, uh, i think from 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 you know we talk about the big issues in terms of uh, you know trying to get away from kind of the london focus in terms of of um, of um, uh, the eu coverage but then uh, from an irish uh, perspective it's like the bottom bottom up where you have to kind of you know you know bring it right down to that granular level yeah, and Jack, could I could I just jump in there and I say like, you know, I think Karen's response contrasts so nicely with what I was saying when I was talking about those big picture things and big mm. picture issues. But I think he's he's absolutely right, and especially in smaller EU states, you know, where the local takes precedence over that sort of international or EU wide perspective, it is incredibly important to trace how those big picture EU narratives are presented very often uh, through those very local stories, you know, that talk about the impact of not just EU funding, but, you know, cultural initiatives, like, you know, European City of Culture has been a huge thing. And uh, I think it has been moments of the, the that kind of national pride framed in that bigger picture of, you know, representing European culture through very local um, moments of pride or, or creating those spaces. I think that is incredibly important. And I think that is something that we will also be really looking to trace to see how those big questions that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk are translated in the media in a you know productive or counterproductive way or in a neutral way, but how they're translated to that local level. Because I think that um, that is hugely important to understand for policymakers. How do you bring um, those those big benefits and translate them into a language that very local populations will understand. Um, and then, you know, on the way, what happens? How do those ideas maybe sometimes become warped and may, or maybe aren't communicated uh, in constructive ways? So I think those are the dynamics that we're also incredibly interested in, in tracking. It's, it's, it's going to be super interesting on that side. Certainly, um, it, you, you mentioned Euronews and I am sat here in the office, but it's really interesting in how things are framed. I don't, I have to always say that I don't speak on behalf of Euronews, I'm an independent that works with them. But when we're having discussions at Euronews, um, it's really interesting and difficult for us to look at the big picture stuff, right, this is a recovery fund, or glyphosate might be banned, or whatever. How does this affect the people? How do we get to those people? And actually, it's it's um, the answers always in our reporting, at least, are generally pretty easy, but take the legwork. So, for instance, the glyphosate thing. Let's go and speak to a farmer who uses glyphosate, and those reports will do well and be interesting and informative. How is this recovery fund going to fund some sort of green transition or digital transition? Let's speak to the people who need the green or the digital transition, or who are going to receive that money. And also when we talk about framing in the European Union as well, I mean, national media will, will always go with their leader's voice first or their minister's voice first in their, their reporting. And Euronews is one of the few that will put the EU voice, I mean, pretty, pretty much often the only, to, to be perfectly honest. There are other media houses in Brussels that will occasionally but will not always prioritize those voices as, as the, the center of their reporting certainly in the member states it will always be what that prime minister or what that president or, or, or whoever said that that, that that comes first and I think it's a, a really interesting uh, dynamic and, and a, a question of how the EU views itself and how it how also the EU institutions use the media in some some way how they choose to to, to activate. Listen, we're, we're running out of time. I would love, if anybody has anything that they, they'd like to say, we've got a couple of minutes. Yeah, Stephen, jump in. Uh, I just want to jump in because it just struck me there as you were talking, Jack. Um, I, I think sometimes the medium dictates what can be covered as well. So if you just take the television example, I mean, it's much easier to cover migration on television than trade because you can see migration, you can go on film as you have pictures. But it's very it's it's difficult to, to cover something like trade or more kind of you know more more sort of hypothetical issues um, in an, on a medium like like television. So so that can very often as well. I think and coming as somebody who worked in television for a brief periods, that can that can dictate as well. I think 
what issues um, are are covered or highlighted um, more more so than others. And that was just a, a point that struck me as you were talking. It, it's really, really true. So, it's, yeah, someone attacked me on Twitter the other day saying, well, stop showing just people getting vaccines for the vac when they're being vaccinated. I was like, we don't have any other choice when it comes to vaccines. That's all we can. That's all we show. Leah, I saw your hand up. Quick. Yes, uh, I just wanted to add to what former speakers said. Uh, we have this platform, uh, civil.g, which is rather popular platform and recently they have introduced their um, um, their online uh, let's say information platform again this which is distributed via facebook and may, may, its main focus is population why the population because it's like facebook is very popular in georgia and they pro just uh, to respond to stephen because uh, they can mm, uh, and it's called, it's in Georgia, but it's called European Report. And they basically present the stories to the uh, wider population in a very simple way, mostly joking and doing it very like uh, in a very light way, like we're using the common language and mainly uh, putting lots of jokes and all the stories uh, within it. So we can, as wider population, get all this information on the current uh, issues, the most important, like grave political uh, things via jokes and very funny stories. And their perspective is obviously very pro-European. So they introduce this pro-European uh, perspective in between the lines. So I wanted to say that you can present whatever information for the wider population using the most appropriate um, means uh, or to communicate that. Thank you. But it takes a lot of work. <laughs> Humor reporting is the most effective and the most difficult to do, without a doubt. Listen, we've, we've already run over our time. I just want to um, say thank you so much to everybody. I, I could personally go on for hours about this kind of topic, and I feel like you guys could do as well. Um, but we'll wrap it up. So I want to say thank you so much to Kieran, to Leah, to Stephen, to Tanya, to Samuel, who spoke earlier as well. It's been a really, really great and interesting discussion. Um, I want to encourage everybody to get following that at mediatized underscore EU. Please also throughout this project, keep checking in on it, um, sharing it. We hope that everyone's going to really engage with it because the, the more engagement this pr project has, the more interesting it will be. It's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy in that sense. So please, everybody, um, go there, go onto the website. Uh, participate in the conversations there and I wish everybody a really wonderful rest of your day. Um, thank you so much for joining and, and goodbye. Yeah, thank you. Take care now everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone. Bye, thank you.